श्री सुधींद्र कुलकर्णी डॉक्टर पडनेकर डॉक्टर कोथारी माय मेनी डिस्टिंग्विश फ्रेंड्स फ्रॉम मुंबई कॉलीग्स यंग फ्रेंड्स लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन आई एम वेरी हैप्पी टू बी हियर इन फैक्ट इट इज वेरी एम्बेरेसिंग टू अटेंड फेलिसिटेशन फंक्शंस आई हैड सेवरल अदर मंड आई एम ट्राइंग आउट टू अवॉर्ड एज मच एज आई कैन बट दिस हैज बीन अ वंडरफुल थिंग टू कम टू मुंबई and thanks to mr kulkarni who has taken all this trouble to organize this i when i was asked to give a talk i first thought i would talk about uh, some of the latest research i'm doing because the research that i am doing today was something i was not doing 3 years ago it is amazing what is happening to some of the fields of science today for example 3 4 years ago graphene became very important a one atom thick sheet of carbon so exciting so wonderful because the electrons in graphene are very different from electrons in any other solid there is a tremendous ballistic transport of charged areas a great solid but since then four years ago for the first time in our laboratory in bangalore we wrote a paper in agavanta chemi saying why graphene why carbon why not why not make the same single atom sheet with non carbon inorganic material like molybdenum sulfide which is a layered material some other materials well we published several things of course what has happened in the last two years in the last two years there are about 200 major papers on this topic alone what has happened is the properties of this single atom layer of molybdenum sulfide is in fact more exciting than graphene it has innumerable properties of a kind that can be exploited in technology one aspect forgetting technology outstanding in the sense that we never thought of such properties before some of them completely new phenomena new properties new direction coming out of the material which i started working on for the first time 4 years ago you know at that my old age i'm now 80 years old i've passed 80 now it is really wonderful to see something like this happen so there's always something exciting and in the last one you know american chemical society just about four months ago wrote to me you know professor rao this thing you started has caught like wildfire would you mind writing a frontiers article in a major journal of the american chemical society i've just written it in fact coming out in my next week or two so it's been a wonderful experience it is this thing this excitement i'm going to talk about today science as one understands science I don't mean technology. Every time we say science, the government minister, prime minister, they say, "Oh, science and technology." No, no, no. Just science. <laughs> science includes engineering, by the way. In my, whenever I say science, please include engineering in it. Engineering is also a science. Unfortunately, in India, they don't understand the difference. They think engineering is non-scientific. It's something else, purely a technical technician's job, which is not true. Modern engineering is so scientific. It is really. a rigorous science engineering science itself is to be treated as science our technology is different i would not talk about it somebody asked me suppose no government supports science what happen suppose there no funding for science what happen doesn't matter science will continue as long as human beings are around because it is the creative work of man science comes out of the creative work of man independent of grants independent of patronage Imagine the days of Newton, date of Lavoisier. There were no grants. They did science, which is beyond our imagination. So grants have nothing to do with science. Governments have nothing to do with science. It is something to do with a human spirit. And this science should not be forgotten. What I am worried about is, as Mr. Kulkarni and many others said, in India we are understanding many things probably well. We are misunderstanding or completely ignoring the essence of what science is all about. If you understood what science stood for, there will be more young people looking for science as their profession. It's the most wonderful way of living. If you imagine, I don't know anyone happier than myself. I don't know anyone. In fact, I'm, even on the stage, I don't see everybody has something complaint. I would even say, <laughs> but I have no complaints. It's a wonderful. You know, I've been doing research for 63 years now, of which 55 years I've been a professor. 55 years of being a professor. I'm not tired, you see. As Mr. Wajpay long ago said, somebody asked him, "It seems you are retiring." He said, "No, I'm not even tired. How can I retire?" <laughs> This is true. 
So science has been a wonderful thing and I'm going to say a few words about this kind of science. Where science, doing science is something <coughs> gives you a way of life. Doing something that is exciting. Creating new venues of knowledge. Create, finding new ideas. New, completely new things. In doing that, of course, there are tricks how to do that. Well, you know, I started my research when there was nothing in India. You know, I hope you, if you don't know, let me tell you. I just entered college when India got freedom. 1947, August, I didn't, just a few months earlier, I entered college. And, you know, we were a very poor na nation. I remind people in Bangalore and even in Bombay, I guess it's true in Bombay, they don't remember that. There was food rationing everywhere in India. We couldn't get rice, we couldn't get cloth. So it was unbelievable condition. If you wanted five dollars, there was no way of getting any foreign exchange, no way of buying chemicals or equipment. Poverty. So after many years in the United States, nearly five, five and a half years, after University of California, Berkeley, where I was a postdoctoral fellow, I came back to India. And what do I find? I took my first job in, in the Indian, Indian Institute of Science. There's nothing. There's no instrument. I was supposed to do spectroscopy without spectrometers. There's no equipment. <laughs> How do you do research when there is nothing? That's the thing. But science cannot stop because there's no equipment. That's the thing. So this is the challenge I had. I was only 25 years old when I came back from U.S. And they, I, 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 I was really worried. It was then, of course, I decided to talk, start in, a, in an area of research where there was not too much crowd and where I could do something in Bangalore with the meager equipment, which was some of which you, I could build myself. We used to build a lot of instruments. Even now, I build a lot of instruments in our lab, with my students. So I started something. This area is now called chemistry of materials. Those days, we started calling it solid state chemistry. Very few people understood what we mean by solid state chemistry. Even they even laughed at it. What is all this solid state? There is nothing like that. Well, I used to be subject of ridicule for a very long time, but I had to suffer that. But today, it is one of the main streams of chemistry. Then in chemistry, there are two major streams going. One is towards biology, another is advanced materials. I belong to the advanced materials channel. And we have so much connection with engineering. Some of the best people in advanced materials today are chemical engineers, for example. Some of my friends were chemical engineers or electrical engineers. So this has been a wonderful experience to start in an area where there was nothing 55 years ago. I always quote a poem by Robert Frost, how to pick an area of research. This is a secret. How to work in India still become very famous in that. You have to pick a lonely road. Frost says the following, this is a poem by Frost, Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry I could not travel both. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The lonely road, never take a crowded road. That is exactly the problem of Indian research. People are working in popular area, where they also publish a good paper. I'm not saying the work is bad. Very good, very satisfying, QED, everything has been solved. Nobody, nobody wants it. You see, there are many questions being answered in India, but questions never been raised. There's no need to answer them. But uh, very good research on areas, in areas where there is no challenge. So that is one of the problems of India. This is what we have to teach children, how to think in a way that is different. This is where, of course, American education with all its faults, and probably education in Europe, particularly in Finland and countries like that, is so good that there is a peculiar innovative and creative spirit that is created, that, that somehow comes into the children. But that I think we have to do. We have to come back to that. But anyway, I started research like this. And slowly, of course, we, with the poverty-stricken India, slowly graduated. The IATs came up, other laboratories come up, have come up. Well, today, of course, there are a few laboratories in India like mine, which are as good as the best. In fact, I, my laboratories are certainly better than, say, one in Purdue or some other place like that. Much better facilities. But we not be Purdue, I'd say Cambridge or somewhere like that. But you know that we have a few labs like that. The reason I'm mentioning is not to be proud of what the lab I have now. But unfortunately, majority of the institutions don't have that. So we have one for every good institution we have, we have 100 very bad ones. Unfortunately, education is done in universities and colleges where facilities are so bad 
that there is no chance for a young undergraduate or a postgraduate to experience the thrill of doing exciting things. That is where China has differed. I keep going to China. In fact, I, gave, I was the Einstein professor in China last year. I went to many places to give lectures. You know, what is amazing is even very fairly ordinary universities. Well, some of them have become very good in the last five years, like Tsinghua University or Jilin University or something like that. But you know, they have facilities which are unbelievable. First, they're very large. Your department of physics, if you go, how many professors? Oh, we have 300 professors. How many students? We have 1,000 PhD students. Impossible. You know, I went to this chemistry lab, which, is a, uh, which gave me a big dinner and so on. I went there uh, to give a lecture and came. And I was, I, there were 1,400 PhD students in that Institute of Chemistry. Numbers so large that they, they, eclipse, they, go, they eclipse the entire world's effort in the quantity of science they are producing. To the extent that this year they are almost close to American production in science quantity, next year they will surpass the United States. America produced 16.5% of world research last year. China was 14.5%. And China will very soon be 16, 16.5%. America will probably be 15. But I'm not worried. America need not worry about it. Nobody can beat American quality of research. Fortunately, that is where this is the really more important thing. Even quality of research, we are not doing too well. Quantity, how much does India produce? Somebody did say that in the report. Our production of science, quantity, only quantity, number of papers in engineering, science, all put together, two and a half percent of world research. That was so 20 years ago. It is still 2 and a half percent. Flat, parallel to the x-axis. <laughs> no change. I don't even mind that. I'm, so I'm not worried about that. What about quality? About five years ago, one of my very good friends, Sir David King, wrote a fantastic article in Nature saying, comparing the contribution of various countries to quality of research. There, India was producing less than 1% of the top 1% of world research. 53.5% of quality research came from the United States. About 30% from Europe. China and India were all, both less than 1% at that time. China is now 5 to 6%. India is still less than 1%. This is the one that bothers me. I'm a very proud Indian, you see. Everything I've done, 1,500 papers I've written from India. I'm an Indian and go to everything from India. I'm very proud of that. And I don't want to see this country lagging behind, not in just quantity, but in quality. Why you want to have top class research coming from India in greater quantity? I don't care if the total number is being small, but it's extremely small, it's very sad. Just two weeks ago, I got another report. Our expenditure in science has not increased, neither has our quality of production increased. The same, less than 1%. It doesn't mean that there are no individuals who are good, please there are, don't misunderstand. There are always individual good people here, good people there, individuals. That is not enough. India is a country, we are a huge country, don't forget. We have future of an enormous possibility. India, if it tries hard, according to me, it can take over the world. Because we are the youngest country in the world. All the professionals, engineers, nurses, doctors, teachers of the world will be produced from India. In fact, not only for India, but the entire world. For whether it is Sweden, Italy, or Japan, Indian teachers will be there, Indian doctors will be there. That is the future that will be there if we properly plan it. But we need not plan that. That is not our problem today. Our problem is to provide good education and to do good science. Well, you know, science, to do good science, there are many things required. First of all, as somebody was reading just a few minutes ago, the attitude, the value system is very poor in India. Suppose you take what are the most important things treasured by the Indian society. They will say the yeah, foreign investment comes on the front page. Some other uh, bank interest rates will come. Then, then what did the IAM graduate from Calcutta, who he got a salary of 75 lakhs, that comes on the front page. I've never seen a front page and anything on science in the last so many years. I don't think we value science very much. In the value system of India, I think science and education come at the bottom. Education is not in the top. So I was just the other day looking at the recent re revised list of quality education in the world at school. I hope you all know that. Which is the country with the top in school education. Not United States. United States is in the way bottom. Number one is Finland. 
हाई क्वालिटी एजुकेशन मेरे पीछे सर हाईली रेस्पेक्टेड इट इज डिफिकल्ट टू गेट जॉब ऑफ ए टीचर मच इजियर टू बिकम एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर हियर एवरीबॉडी वांट्स टू बी एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर एवरी इन द लेफ्ट ओवर कम्स फॉर टीचिंग द ऑल्टरनेट्स विद द मच इज नॉट अ गुड थिंग पर इट वेल बट इन ए सो साइंस इज अ वंडरफुल प्रोफेशन सम ऑफ वी हैव टू मेक श्योर दैट पीपल अंडरस्टैंड दैट एक्सेप्ट दैट यू नो to do really good things let me tell one minute what is my own personal experience what is it you want you want to have a peace of mind you want to enjoy doing it first of all you know you can't uh, we must have a nice family life i've been very fortunate having my wife a wonderful family life. no 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 problems of any sort however that, that what i mean by that is if somebody is always fighting with his wife is unlikely to do good research <laughs> because his mind is always stricken with the worry about his uh, Fights at home. <laughs> okay, the joke to part. Seriously speaking, I think one has to make up one's mind in India. What is it that is important for India? I think for India, education and then science or science education together, I think is very very important. And we are a very critical society. As you know, we are very critical of ourselves. We are very intolerant of everything. In this highly intolerant society, which doesn't tolerate anything else. Why is it we are tolerating mediocrity so much? You are, you know, if you ask, you know, whether it is religion, caste, everything, very intolerant of something or the other. When it comes quality, or mediocrity, we tolerate. Mediocrity is perfectly accepted in India. I think if there is going to be social revolution, the social revolution in India should be for better quality education. We should all join together and demand better quality education from our schools, from our institutions, from our governments. But anyway, coming back, as far as science is concerned, I'm mainly talking about science. Well, you know, people <coughs> ask me, "Who is you know? Uh, you are 80 years old. How come you are still working, publishing? Like you know, every day in my life, I keep on writing something. I have a lot of things to write. Of course, I'm not the only one. There are people who write much more than me. But I have so many students working. At any one time, I have about 25 PhD students and postdocs. The last two years are cut down. Now I have only 15. I'm going to cut down because I'm getting a bit too old. Uh, I always had about 25 in the last 15, 20, 30 years in my group. So we have so much to write, so much to read, so many things to do. Keeping yourself so busy, it's been a wonderful thing. In fact, that keeps you very young. And that is more as I also tell them in people, how do you, uh, how you know, at 80, how come you are so energetic? I have no, I have no extra energy, nothing at all. I don't take any special pills for it. <laughs> But only, I always say. Uh, it is a, a quote to them, the famous uh, Kabir Das, Kabir Das uh, famous song you all know. Kabir Das, uh, he, he talked about Maname Ganga, Maname Kashi, Maname Dhyan Karo. Same thing about science, education, everything. Maname Maname Buddhi, Maname Shakti, everything. I really believe India should use that man. Man is the one that is not being used in Bangalore. You see. Is, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that I come from that city. It has now become number one in ranking for what? Number of rapes and suicides. It's unbelievable. Three thousand suicides last year. You don't believe it. You know, people are making a lot of money, but they have lost their mind. All the young people going with nice suits and briefcases, but empty heads. What do you do with them? No, this is no. This is a sad thing. You please worry about it. They may get money for five years. They are already exhausted at the age of 35. They want to retire, but here I am at the 80. I am looking for some more years of good research. Anyway, coming back to what I was saying, you know, what I, what I found in my life is to remember great names in science. Lena mentioned a few names. I think of these great stories. In fact, this is how I teach science: telling a lot of stories in a classroom. It's very important that our students learn about science, about scientists, how they made discoveries, rather than the stupid thing that is in the textbook. You know, you throw the book, give them the book to read, and you say something else in a classroom. And you know, in fact, we just mentioned Jesse Bowes. None of them. In fact, the other day I asked all my students. None of them knew exactly what Jesse Bowes had done. Here is an Indian physicist in the 1895, 19th century, mind you. He made a discovery of telegraphy in Calcutta, working in a little college called Presidency College. How did he do that? It's really amazing. Even today, when you look at what he did, he should have actually got a Nobel Prize. 
He should have shared it with Marconi, but he was cheated out of it. Actually, he was cheated. There's no doubt about it. The IPP in the United States and also the Royal Society in London have come out with beautiful stories about how he got cheated out of it. They, they, God, he clearly acknowledged that he missed out because people, you know, after all, we were a colony at that time, nobody to push a case of J.C. Bose. <coughs> Amazing, how did he do that? This story our young people should learn in school. This story in colleges, people should know how he did it. They don't remember, they don't even know that C.V. Raman didn't have a job as a scientist when he, both he, when he got his Nobel Prize or when he got his fellowship with the Royal Society. When he became an FRS, I hope you know that being an FRS is difficult even today, but then when he was made an FRS at a young age, it was much more difficult. We were under the British rule. He was in Nagpur as a senior accounts officer of the British government. During evenings, he used to go to Nagpur Science College, did experiments, and based on those results, he wrote his famous papers on acoustics. That is the one that got him a fellowship with the Royal Society. Most of his Nobel Prize is mainly because of the evening like. Evening research he did in a place in Calcutta, not because he had a regular job, 24 hour job, paying money for him as a big scientist. And he is, that is the story of India. And I don't know whether you have told him the children as teachers, some of you. Ramanujan in a miserable hole in Tamil Nadu. I don't know, I was there two years ago to give a lecture, Ramanujan lecture in that little place. Even today it is a backward India, a back, I'm not backward, somewhere. It is not the mainstream. In that miserable place, how did he write these 3,000 theorems and conjectures? You know, you worry about it. You tell your children about it. How did he do that? It is because he got a big scholarship, professorship? No. His salary, when it was very high salary, was 75 rupees eventually he got. That was towards the end. To start with, there was zero salary. How did he do that? These are Indian stories. Of course, if you leave India and go for examples elsewhere, there are even bigger and better examples. Of course, my own hero is Michael Faraday. I never tire myself of telling about Michael Faraday. Two minutes on Faraday because otherwise I'll, uh, once I get it, I have to say, it is one of those compulsive things I have about Faraday. Remember, he is a man with only three years of schooling. But as people say, if only you count everything he did in science, as Lord Rutherford said, he could have easily got five Nobel Prizes in the 20th century. Unfortunately, it was in the 19th century where there was no Nobel Prize. He discovered loss of electrolysis. He discovered benzene. Organic chemists would have given him a Nobel Prize for that. He, would have, he discovered electricity. I think worth the Nobel Prize. Easily. And magnetism, another Nobel Prize. The word paramagnetic, diamagnetic, electrode, ion, cation, electrolysis, all these words are coined by Michael Faraday in the 19th century. And this man with only three years of schooling. How did he do that? And you know, he was a simple man. Greatness in humans goes with simplicity, mind you. Not by dressing yourself with a suit and a boot and all, but by simplicity. He was such a simple man. And you know, the famous thing is, of course, when he discovered electricity, the finance minister asked him, what is the use of this discovery? You know the famous answer. He said, sir, one day you will tax it, he told him. <laughs> and then when the prime minister came, again, just like our prime minister is coming to Bombay, he, and then prime minister in England, Mr. Farrah, what is this electricity you are discovering? What is the use of it? He said, sir, what is the use of a newborn baby? He said. <laughs> You know, he was a very simple man. And then, you know, he was given knighthood by Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria wrote, Dear Mr. Faraday, I would like you to be knighted. Of course, the minute he accepted knighthood, he would become Sir Michael Faraday. He wrote back, My dear Queen, you have been always so gracious, so kind to me. But people call me Mike, people call me Michael. I want to remain that. I don't want a knighthood. He didn't like that. How many do that? How many do that? And second, you know, this is very important for India, what I'm saying. People want to become directors, then they want to become director general, they want to some other general. In India, very common. Everybody wants to sit on the top somewhere. Very few people say, let me sit on the real chair in the lab. That is where the real chair is. Faraday was one of them. Then you see, the Royal Society, of which I have been a proud member for more than for 30 and odd years now, he wrote, they wrote to him, Mr. Faraday, we would like you to become president of the Royal Society. It is the highest honor at that time in England. Even today, in fact. 
And he wrote back, thank you so much. I don't think I should be president of such important uh, academy like Royal Society because my place is actually in the laboratory here in Bangalore. In Bangalore. That is it. The reason I'm telling you this story, because I have so many stories can keep you for another 10 hours, I won't do that. And the reason I'm telling you this story is how is it we don't have many people doing that in India? The people who deny themselves idiotic positions, stupid, I, I used the word idiotic the other day, I was misquoted in newspapers. <laughs> this is exactly what I said. We take idiotic decisions, idiotic positions, all this, you know, what is there in big job, in some big uh, government job? I think we should work in the lab, do new things, particularly with young people. With, you know, I'm very proud that everything I've done is with young people. About 150 people have got PhDs with me till now. All, everyone put together, about 400 people must have worked with me in the last 50 and odd years. It's been a wonderful experience. And that I think we should take out. And Faraday also has many other rules. See, I hope you all know that. He said nobody should give a lecture for more than one hour. I hope you all know that. <laughs> yeah, so I have to, yeah, don't worry. I'm, I'm within my time. And uh, one of the things in here is to light a candle when he started a lecture for children. And by the time the candle had one hour, but the standard candle, world, I hope you all know that, the standard candle is one hour. And it would just go off and you would stop the lecture. And he said, no one has a right to impose himself on an audience for more than one hour. And that's why I keep telling all the young children in the school, whenever I say that, they all like it. And many teachers, you know, they have two hours special class. Never attend them. Never. <laughs> Never. And worst is, there are some teachers, even in IITs, I remember, they don't, they do stupid teaching throughout the year, throughout the term. Just before the exam, they will have special classes. <laughs> never attend a special class. They should do regular hours. I have never taken a special class in my entire life. I've taught. It's not necessary. Think you do your job during the regular hours, that is more than enough. Already, you know, we teach too much. You know, imagine the IIT is terrible actually. 15 hours, 45 lectures in a course, bore you to death actually. Each, because all the teachers are basically boring. I mean, let us face it. There's nothing, you know, you have to make it exciting. How do you make it? 45 times you have to make it exciting. Like, wow. So we have to cut short the number of uh, contact hours and I think make it much more interesting. And then anyway, fortunately, you know, the teachers, another problem in India, the teachers want to teach everything that they know to the student. <laughs> Fortunately, we are lucky, they don't know too much. <laughs> okay, coming back. I want to close my lecture in the last five minutes, ten minutes maybe. You know, as I told you, it is very important to tell these stories. I hope I convinced you to talk to students about science includes the origin of how ideas got created. See, there is no way of teaching children how to become creative. Otherwise, they would you just go to a classroom, learn how to be creative, come back like a machine and you become creative. No, there is no way. You can teach them all the stuff in the books, but never teach them how to become creative. One possible way is get them excited about great scientists, their lives, how they did science. Maybe that will help them to become creative. And then, you know, another thing also, this applies to India particularly. You know, there is a very famous Hindu in, in, in the, our Sanskrit, and it is amazingly also in Christianity. Amazingly, even in Buddhism, I found this common in, commonality in all religions. What is it? Fearlessness comes out of the absence of self. Selfless people only can be fearless. God has been very kind to me, I have been very fearless. I have nothing to hide. I know, no, nothing, you can take anything, I have no secrets uh, and all that. I'm very proud of that. And I found many people changing their opinion depending on who the audience is, who is asking question. Because of the fear, you know, because they want something, they can never give their opinion. You see, scientists therefore have become very honest and less selfish. In fact, just out of respect to Another great man, great Indian, who exactly 100 years ago got a Nobel Prize, first Nobel Prize of India, Rabindranath Tagore, I hope you all know that, 
Hundred years ago, he got everybody. People have forgotten. Hundred fifty years ago, we had Vivekananda. We have forgotten, and we never think of all these great Indians we had. And I'll read one poem from Gitanjali about selfishness. I came out alone on my way to my tryst, but who is this that follows me in the silent dark? I move aside to avoid his presence, but I escape him not. He makes the dust rise from the earth with his swagger. He adds his loud voice to every word that I utter. He is my own little self, my lord. He knows no shame, but I am ashamed to come to thy door in his company. You know, it is very true. Selfishness, if you have, you can't do good signs of it. Everything he says is true. Well, then what is it that we need to do in India? We have to produce more people who are just committed to science. Not to just self, not to just traditions. We may not produce a Faraday, we may not produce a Raman, we may not produce a Ramanujan. We at least produce highly dedicated scientists. Well, for this there is very little time. Mr. Kulkarni somehow didn't mention about time. I would like to mention that. There's no time. India doesn't have that much time to do all this. The competitive world is so bad today. I hope you all know that, you know, I work on a day-to-day -day basis. I compete with the, the best of them in America or Europe or Korea or China. My God, the rate at which things are happening, you have to be galloping to remain stationary. You have to be running to remain stationary. That is how bad it is. <coughs> but I always quote Arvind Toffler's Future Shock, that book, where he says about society, he says, it is extremely difficult for a society to get used to the rate of change of acceleration. Acceleration itself is a second derivative of, you know that. Rate of change of acceleration, you can imagine, that's exactly what is happening in science. Today, if we have not done real active science in a major competitive field for two, three years and gone away as big administrator somewhere, don't expect to come back and stop again. Forget about it. It's impossible to do science on a discontinuous basis. So this is the time. We need very little. We have very little time to in, in India. And we have to respect that. In fact, I always uh, read a co quotation of Michael Faraday about time, how valuable it is. You know, he says, what is the longest and the shortest thing in the world? Swiftest and the most slow. The most divisible, the most extended. The least valued and the most regretted. What is it that God Almighty thought was so valuable that he gave only limited amount of it for you? Time. If God Almighty thought time is something cheap, you would have all lived for 500 years. Thank God it's only 100 years. We can become useless before that anyway. So anyway, I think we have to do in a very quick time. India has no time. India, according to me, the global leader in science that your report talked about today, we can become global leaders if we start galloping today, maybe in 10, 20 years, we can be one of the top five leaders. Recently, our experience in nanoscience and technology has told me where dedicated effort, concentrated funding, concentrated targeted funding is done in a small area, India can produce results. We have to do more and more of that. We have to learn that. Well, how to stop here? You know, again, suddenly I remember, uh, in Gita Anjali, I think it's a, which poem, I don't remember the number. Uh, again, Tagore, it, 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 you know, he says, time has, I, I'm getting old, he says. Time has to say goodbye. I have locked the doors of my house, given away the, two, given away the keys. But before I go away, let me tell you, the world has given me so much that I don't think I've given the world enough. That is exactly how I feel about science. And I think... We all have much to contribute to science. And I also owe this quotation to my wife. Another thing I'll always remember in the last two, three months particularly, after I read about it, which I didn't know, is what Bismillah Khan, the great musician, said. Bismillah Khan, I hope you all know that, he was extraordinarily, he was a devout Muslim who also prayed to Hindu gods. He, in, the, in the banks of Kashi, he used to pray and play Shahanai to all the gods there. He was like Kabir Ras in many ways. And you know, he said, Oh God, give me the opportunity to be in the world of music till the last day. I say the same about myself, about science. Thank you.